The conservative leadership race has changed ever since it began in February when the Conservative Caucus used the Reform Act to oust Aaron O'Toole as leader of the Conservative Party. Now debates are being held as to whether or not the party should move more to the center, as Jean Chere argues, or very much be the Conservative right-wing alternative like Pierre Polyev argues and joining me now to discuss which one of those paths may be best in order to lead the Conservative Party into the future is Michael Solberg. He's a former Harper government Conservative staffer as well as a political commentator on many news networks. Tasha Carradine is author of the book The Right Path, How Conservatives Can Unite, Inspire and Take Canada Forward. She's also national campaign co-chair of Jean Charest and his leadership campaign to lead the Conservative Party. And Melanie Paradis is former director of communications to former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. Hello to the three of you. Thanks so much for uh, making the time and for joining me here today. Michael, I'll start out with you. I mean, what do you ultimately think based off of the way that the Conservative leadership campaign has developed ever since February? And, you know, the way that I kind of mentioned there in that first piece that I mentioned as to whether or not moving more to the center, being kind of more moderate versus being very much a very much like kind of right wing party uh, as, you know, the Conservative Party. Which one of those two paths does the Conservative Party need to move in in order to win the next election? And how do you balance, you know, some members wanting to do um, kind of the more right wing uh, alternative versus some members who want to move more to the center? Sure, sure. Thanks, Wyatt. Uh, you know, and it's the big question. Uh, frankly, I think everybody's asking the same thing. And really the immediate work uh, that this new leader needs to undertake right away is that difficult work of uniting your caucus behind a common cause. And obviously there's going to be questions on issues uh, and different opposing viewpoints uh, on the issues. But at the end of the day, this uh, opposition needs to come together put a, a pretty uh, rocky couple of years behind them and unite behind the common cause of actually growing their support in the areas that they need to grow their support. They've had limited electoral success in the past couple of years uh, and have grown their popular vote in areas where the vote was already very highly concentrated. And I think if they have any hope, of course, uh, in beating Justin Trudeau or whoever the liberal leader might be by then, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, they need to unite behind uh, an understanding of how can they grow their support. And to me, and I think to many, that includes moving to the center and attracting new voters and sharing a conservative vision uh, in areas where they haven't had traditional electoral success in recent years. And Tasha, this is going back a few months ago now, but Jean Chere said in an interview that he did a few months ago that he believed um, Pierre Polyev should be disqualified from leading the Conservative Party. And there was lots of talk as to whether or not that was, you know, kind of a literal um, sentence or whether it was more kind of metaphorically used and many people kind of said it was more of a metaphorical use saying that Jean Chret believes that some of the things that um, Pierre Polyev has done such as his support of say the so-called freedom convoy that uh, took place in the nation's capital does not necessarily represent conservative values and the current values of the conservative party is something I have heard some um, conservative insiders conservative supporters say um, but when you look at things that like, again, the freedom convoy that Pierre Polyev um, has, you know, supported and he was, you know, a part of um, for much of the time that it uh, took place in the nation's capital. Do you think things like that would be a positive thing or a negative thing when looking at his record and say a general election campaign? Well, I think it goes, uh, Wyatt, to the sort of the debate that you were referring to earlier about which direction the party should take, um, because Mr. Polly have a staked out a uh, very different ground than Mr. Charest has. And they're the two, I guess, leading currents. And I wouldn't even describe them really as conservative or, or center and um, and conservative. I think it's more um, populist is the second one. Center, center right represents populist is what uh, Pierre Polyev represents and they're very different in their appeal because uh, elements like you said the convoy and others um, they're not if you look at polling it's very clear that you're not going to get a majority of Canadians who support either the aims or the means of the convoy uh, there's sympathy for some of the causes and issues people had certainly some of the stories people you know, lost everything during the pandemic, they were desperate, and a lot of people are united in their hatred of Justin Trudeau, but the the way it was conducted and, and the ends to which it went and the other elements associated with it leave a bad taste in many voters' mouths. And those voters tend to be more of the center-right voters who don't feel comfortable 
uh, for the party that they would vote for, for being associated with all the elements that were in that convoy. So it is problematic if you bet on that, because when you look at numbers, just numbers, um, you know, as Michael was saying, uh, you got to look where the votes are, where they're needed. And the conservatives need to grow their base in the GTA. They need to grow in Quebec. They need to grow in Atlantic Canada, where their numbers are lower. But the seats are, the seat count is, is higher. Um, that's why the liberals can get less of the popular vote and get a majority, as it stands now in the last couple of elections. So the conservatives have to do some soul searching. And I think on the center right, we get a much also respect conservative principles. You don't leave those behind. You're just not a populist. It's a very different uh, conversation. And Melanie, when you look at some, you know, the various conservative leadership candidates, I guess just pick up on what Tasha is saying. I mean, I personally have interviewed some of the conservative leadership candidates, the majority of the conservative leadership candidates, and Pierre Polyev is one of those candidates who has not yet done an interview, not just with me, but with many other media outlets as well. I mean, a lot of his messaging um, defunding the CBC, obviously, um, you know, one of Canada's most watched news channels. Um, there's also talk from the uh, Polly Evera campaign as to doing things like, again, um, pulling back on COVID vaccine mandates um, where they still exist and just restrictions relating to COVID uh, in general. I mean, how has that been resonating with, obviously it's been resonating with Polly Evera supporters, but with just members of the Conservative Party more broadly speaking? Well, I think you kind of had to struggle a bit just to list some of the policies that he's actually talked about in this leadership race. There have been shockingly few. I think some of the other candidates have have had much more robust uh, policy platforms and uh, and plans that they've put forward ideas of what their conservative leadership would would look like. Uh, and Pierre Polyev has been, frankly, really lacking in that space. There are a number of things that he talks about frequently, like firing Tiff Macklem and cryptocurrency and you know, stuff like that. And But at the end of the day, he he really hasn't been pegged to many policies. And there's this, you know, this conversation that we, the pundits continue to have and that the media continues to have about whether or not if Pierre Polyev wins, if he's going to have to pivot to center, or pivot to wherever. And my argument continues to be pivot from where? I don't know where this guy is. I, I couldn't put him on the spectrum of, of more or less right wing because we don't actually know what his policies are. And, and no one's really had the opportunity to vet them because as you've noted, he hasn't really done any media interviews and he also hasn't really participated in debates. I mean, there were a couple, but like, yeah. so I think that that's it, the biggest, the thing that's most interesting to me is if he does win this leadership, he's actually going to have the largest mandate of not just any leader of the conservative movement, but I think any leader of any political party. And by largest mandate, I don't just mean the highest number of votes or whatever. I mean, he's not had, <laughs> he's not been pegged to anything. He's going to be able to, on day one, make up whatever he wants as his policies. And no one will be able to say, oh, you're flip-flopping because it's not flip-flopping from anything. Mel, just before I go to Michael, I want to follow up with you. I mean, how is this different? I mean, a lot of people criticize the way that Doug Ford went about his 2022 election campaign, not doing very many interviews with media in that campaign as well. How might this be different if it is different at all um, regarding, again, to Pierre Polyev and the way that he's approaching his campaign in terms of public availability, media availabilities and interviews with you know media and with the press um, as compared to, again, Doug Ford's 2022 election campaign? I, I think tactically they're similar, but in reality, they're very different because Doug Ford was in front of the media every single day during COVID. For two years, he was in everyone's living rooms. There isn't an Ontarian who doesn't know like everything they need to know about Doug Ford to decide whether they wanted to vote for him or not. The same cannot be said for Pierre Polyev. There, there are many people either, you know, either in our membership or in the general populace who, who don't know who he is or exactly where he stands on things. And so by avoiding these opportunities to, to clarify his position, either in media interviews or, or in debates, uh, it really just leaves a lot of question marks for people, I think. Michael, again, when you look at the way that Pierre Polyev specifically has approached this campaign, obviously Pierre Polyev is perceived as the front runner in this leadership campaign, but what happens to obviously Pierre Polyev and Jean Charest as I'm sure Tasha and Melanie would also agree and yourself are proposing different 
uh, very different visions in terms of the Conservative Party. So if Pierre Polyev does win this leadership and wins the leadership of the Conservative Party, what happens to all the people who didn't vote for Pierre Polyev and who did not see him as a you know, good candidate to lead the Conservative Party? And how do, again, the people who voted for Jean Charest, Leslin Lewis, Roman Babers, Scott Aitchison, any of the other candidates, how do they feel welcomed in the Conservative Party? No, oh, it's a fantastic question and an existential one. Uh, and it's the first task of this new leader will be able to reach across uh, into these camps and begin to build bridges that have been burned <laughs> to date through a very long and arduous campaign, particularly between the Polyev uh, and Charest camps. Um, you know, when you have 675,000 members that now hold memberships and they're casting ballots uh, for this leadership race. It's an enormous party. It's the largest political movement in the country, uh, in a, a country that is numerous regions at different values from coast to coast to coast. Um, and in a big catch all large tent party like that, uh, the work to keep them united includes making um, making compromise and, and working with your caucus to help define what your policy agenda will be for the party. What will your vision be for Canadians? And to my earlier point, if they're going to earn themselves electoral success in areas where they need it, uh, they're going to have to begin that work right away. Uh, and that includes uh, Mr. Polyev and whatever vision Jean Trey has for himself and the involvement of the party moving forward. I hope he'd like to stay involved, but uh, you know, I think it's obvious that there's no love lost between those two. But this uh, this ex uh, extends as well to um, any of these prospective leaders reaching out to these other camps. But it's not just Pierre being the perceived front runner. He is the front runner. Every credible poll of members suggests uh, that he is. And I think that's the real question of whether or not uh, he'll be able to reach across into those camps and build those bridges that his campaign's done a pretty good job at, at burning, frankly, through, uh, through, like I said, a pretty divisive rhetoric that has come over the last uh, eight or so months. And Tasha, when you look at the way that Pierre Polyev has approached this campaign, obviously, He's been, you know, spouting different ideas. He's been talking about some of his different ideas for the country in the midst of this conservative leadership campaign. But how does he take some of those policies that he has proposed in the leadership campaign and then turn those into policies that would actually be enacted by a poly of government? And I mean, obviously, it's one thing to have support from the membership of the conservative party. But on the policies that he has proposed, how does he gain support from everyday Canadians too, and take support from, say, the Liberals or, or the NDP or any of the other parties in Canada? Well, um, he has some policies in the window, but they're not fleshed out. I mean, Melanie um, made the point that she doesn't really know what he stands for. There are certain things he has said, um, which other candidates have as well, for example, on immigration to, you know, make credentials recognition easier. But great to say that, what's your plan for doing it when those competencies rest with provincially regulated bodies. Um, other things of, you know, removing gatekeepers, you know, for things like housing, make, making your age proof. And what, what does that actually mean? It's a slogan. It's not a policy. Uh, it's an idea. To your point, I have no idea how he would do that because he hasn't said how he would do that. It's just things he wants to do. Other than the CDP, um, I think he would have a fight on his hands particularly in French Canada and Quebec and all the parts of Canada that depend on Radio Canada for information. Um, because, uh, you know, there's uh, in the English side, there's maybe more of a debate on how it should get its revenue. But on the French side, clearly there's a great appetite for having that continued programming of Radio Canada. So, you know, it, it, a lot of the stuff he has said um, has been also in very controlled environments. And that goes to, what I think Melanie made too, is that he has not been tested in the fire of questions uh, like a Doug Ford, for example, who was facing the media at scrums and uh, in, in situations where he did not control the narrative, um, putting out videos on Six Buzz Toronto and, you know, on YouTube and various platforms uh, is fine, but it, it doesn't put you in the heat of the moment and the fire you're going to face unless you decide to, if you were to govern, that you wouldn't talk to the media. Well, that was one of the chief criticisms of Stephen Harper, that he didn't like to talk to the media. And that did not do the conservatives any favors in terms of getting reelected in 2015. Um, so you know, you've got to be able to deal with them or you will not win an election. So I think that that is an important test for any politician to pass. And he's not passed that one. Um, I, I think it's a shame because that's the whole point of his leadership was to really expose not only the candidate, not only the, the, the members, but the candidates to the rigors they would face 
in an election. And clearly, I mean, you know, Jean Charest clearly has been through many elections um, that were tough. He's been on that hustings and he knows what to face. So I, it's one of the reasons that I'm, uh, I'm supportive of him. And Mel, when you look at the way that Jean Charest has approached this leadership campaign, obviously, um, Jean Charest, again, as I mentioned before, and as Tasha has mentioned before, um, is seen as, you know, one of the more moderate candidates or the more center right candidate uh, in this leadership race. How does he differ from, say, Aaron O'Toole, the former leader of the Conservative Party, not just on policy, but in terms of, you know, how he um, goes about being a politician and how he goes about connecting with Canadians and with the people that he's ultimately trying to earn votes from? It's a good question and one you're going to get me in trouble for. Um, I think that whereas Aaron O'Toole was very passionate about policy, I think that Jean Charest, the sense I get from him and uh, is that I think he knows who he is really well and he knows who he is as a leader and who he wants to be as prime minister. And, um, and I'm not sure if that was ever true of, of Aaron O'Toole. Um, and I'm not sure this is true of the other candidates actually. Although I, I think that um, Scott Aitchison is, uh, is, has a phenomenal future at, ahead of him in the conservative movement. And I hope that at the end of this leadership race that whoever wins um, deputizes him in some way to, to help him be one of the you know unity players i think that he could play a really important role in in bringing people together because there's one thing that i've heard consistently from a lot of members that i've spoken to it's that while they don't think that scott Aitchison has has a chance of winning this leadership race they all really liked the campaign that he ran and the policies that he put forward and the way he carried himself um, and i think that that's going to be really important going forward for um you know having him be one of the cool heads that will hopefully prevail in, in decision-making. Michael, I just want you to pick up just lastly, before we conclude on that piece that Mel mentioned, how is, I, I guess, just kind of almost the same question to you in the sense of how does, you know, someone like Pierre Polyev, for example, explain to Canadians why he wants to be prime minister? And do you think he has ultimately detailed to Canadians why he wants to be prime minister as good as say someone like Jean Charest has done? Yeah, I think he's done a phenomenal job. I think his political communications have been top notch and he's, they've been headline grabbing, frankly. And Tash and Melanie might might not agree with me on this, but it's it's part of the reason why he's the front runner is probably going to walk away with this on, by September 10th. Uh, he's been able to uh, describe bread and butter issues for conservatives in simple terms. And while he may not offer a ton of solutions in terms of the types of levers that he would pull should he be the head of government eventually it's enough of attention grabbing and enough that members are buying into that he's going to offer them solutions that he is the solution and frankly if you're a progressive in this uh, in this country namely a progressive big l liberal i'd be scared uh, i'd be looking at the momentum that this guy is building in this party and how tired and out of ideas we are me saying as if i were uh, a liberal supporter, which of course I'm not, uh, but I'd be worried. Uh, Justin Trudeau is out of ideas. Uh, he's lost an enormous amount of momentum, uh, and it's a matter of time before the knives come out, frankly, in his own party for him. Uh, and meanwhile, Pierre Polyev is going to lead with historic numbers come September 10th with an incredible amount of momentum, a strong story that he's been telling for months. Uh, so, yes, to answer your question, why I think he's done a great job at telling Canadians why he wants to be prime minister. He did it right out of the gates as the first candidate to declare. He's been the front runner ever since, and he hasn't looked back. 